I wonder how many girls today would put bugs in their hair for beauty and art. Some would. I kind of think many would not. It would be a long time before cities and towns would again choose to turn off all the lights. When they did, it would be not for beauty, but from fear in World War II. For the boys who danced the girls around that warm spring evening, under the new wonder of the electric lights, perspiring under layer and layer of wool and cotton, for everyone in attendance, dancing under the lights or when they were extinguished, watching the silhouettes in the dark, the future did seem very bright. They could not imagine then what lay before them, just around the proverbial corner. What lay before them were the trenches in France, World War One. Many of the boys who danced the girls that night would soon lie beneath the soil of a foreign, distant land. One of them, well, I don't know for sure that he was at the dance, but he could have been. He lived there. Would go on to be the third most decorate. Um, third. I, I think third. I should have checked before recording. Some military history buff would surely correct me or confirm my memory, but I think third most decorated U.S. Army soldier of World War One. I. I think he single-handedly captured a machine gun nest. Now we all remember the most decorated soldier of World War One. That was Sergeant York. They made a movie about him, and we all remember the most decorated soldier of World War Two. That was Audie Murphy. They made a movie star out of him. But second, third, seventh, nineteenth. Well, we remember who won the gold, not who won the bronze. Locally, though. Our hero was not forgotten. He was the honored guest at every opening and ribbon cutting, VFW dance, and Fourth of July celebration, and he accepted those honors humbly. But he would never speak of what he had seen in the war or what he had done to earn his medals. And he never married. They put up a monument to honor the immortal memory of the local boys who had given their lives in the war. Right downtown, on the main street where it met the railroad tracks, local historians have preserved a program from the monument's dedication, which, barring a printer's error, recorded all the names, which were also cast into the base of the monument. They don't have a photo of the monument, though, and apparently no one does. At least none are known. Perhaps some old woman. Unaware that anyone would be looking for it, has one in her memory box, but none are known. Because, even in a small town, downtown real estate is valuable. It was owned by the city right downtown. Seemed a dandy place for new construction when the city decided it needed to extend its physical plant. So, shortly after installing it, the council voted to move the monument to a new location. It was disassembled and the pieces temporarily placed in the back of a county store yard. But reassembling the monument meant expenditures. A site would have to be purchased. It would have to be graded and developed. Lighting would have to be installed. Artisans would be required to reassemble the pieces. Expenditures meant taxes, and politicians are always willing to kick that can down the road. So the pieces sat in the store yard as the weeks and months and years ticked by, until another generation, perhaps unaware of the significance of the tangled bronze and steel in the high weeds at the back of the yard, junked it for scrap metal on the original site. Dedicated to the memory of those who gave their lives to end war and to keep us free, stands the headquarters of the city police, who also risk their lives for the community, but who take liberty away individually, as the law decrees.